let us stand as we go directly to the word of God. And we're going to be coming from uh, the book of Galatians tonight, uh, chapter 5. And I'm going to read verse 22 and 23. And the word of the Lord reads, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And my subject tonight is fruit of the Spirit. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we come before your throne again, Lord God. Oh God, looking for your grace and your mercy, Lord Jesus, Lord. Oh God, we thank you, Lord God, for this time that you've given us, Lord, that we may come into your house and hear what thus says your word, Lord God. Now, Lord God, I pray that your word come forth, Lord God, with power and demonstration of your spirit, that our hearts, Lord God, may be changed, Lord, that we may be built up, Lord, grounded and rooted, Lord God, in your truth. Lord. We thank you for your word tonight, Lord God. Right now, God, I pray, oh God, that you touch, Lord God, as I decrease, Lord God. You increase before your people, Lord God, and we'll be forever to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise that is due unto your wonderful name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. The fruit of the Spirit. In the text that we read in Galatians, Paul is making a sharp contrast in the difference between the fruit that is produced through the flesh and the fruit that we produce through the Spirit of God. In a few scriptures, right above the scripture that we read, he named a whole pile of things that the flesh will produce, like fornication and adultery and witchcrafts and variance and all kind of stuff. And he makes a sharp contrast because he wants us to know that that's not the type of fruit that the people of God produces. That's the type of fruit that the world will produce. So, Jesus often used the Gospels uh, as, a, as an analogy to tell about the righteousness through fruit. And I know that we've read probably quite a few stories uh, in the Gospel where, where um, Jesus talks about fruit. He says that if a tree don't bear fruit, it's no good to do but chop it down, and throw it in the fire. So even Jesus uses a lot of analogy of fruit, and that's because that fruit is not manufactured. You, you can't really take and run something through a machinery and then come out with a fruit on the other side. Now, you have some companies that attempt to copy or, or, or the taste and the texture and the color of fruit, but you, you just can't manufacture fruit. Fruit has to be grown. Fruit has to come from a tree. Fruit has to, it's a process for fruit to come forth. I mean, there's a little tangerine tree back there by the field, and too many people don't know about that one, and I don't tell them about it. And I watch it all during the summertime blossom. And then you see the little buds come on it and then the little green fruit come around. And when right around uh, fall, I know that it's almost time because they begin to turn orange. And right after Christmas, after the cold pass, because the cold make those fruits sweet. That's when I go and pick. 
So that tree really produces not very big fruit, but they're very good. That tree red really produces fruit, and though it takes a process for, for me to taste the sweetness of those fruit. So the fruit of the Spirit is a process in our life. I, I don't think that anybody gets saved today and then have all of these fruit tomorrow. If you have, raise your hand. I want to ask you how you did it. So it's a process for us. Jesus, so, the, so he, he makes this analogy in the Gospels to differentiate righteousness and unrighteousness. So that, that's one of the analogies that Jesus, is, Jesus uses in the Gospel is the fruit. He also says that Jesus says that the tree is known by its fruit. So if I'm going to pick oranges, I wouldn't go to a lime tree because I know that's a lime tree. I'm seeking oranges. So when Jesus comes seeking fruit, he's not going to go to a tree that's unrighteous. He's going to be looking towards a righteous tree to see what kind of fruit is bearing on that tree. So we are going to be known by the fruit that we produce. That's how the unsaved will know who we are. That's how heaven will know who we are, by the fruit that we produce. So being that we have the Spirit of God, we should produce spiritual fruit. Everyone agree with that? So if we don't have the Spirit of God, we will produce unrighteous fruit, or fruit of, from the world. So we should be producing spiritual fruit because we have the Holy Ghost. Romans 7 and 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, this, this scripture didn't say that we should bring forth fruit unto man. It says that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So this spiritual fruit that we produce is genuine. It's not something that we can really make up because it won't be acceptable to God because we are bringing forth the fruit that he is looking for. So, if we notice in Galatians 5, 22 and 22, through 33, Paul names nine fruit that we are to produce. Again, there's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, we'll find that the fruit that Paul identifies are divided into three subcategories. So the, these fruit are, are just not running here and running there. They're categorized for a specific purpose. Let's look at the categories. First, fruit which turns our thought towards our relationship with God. That's the first category. And those consist of the first three fruit, love, joy, and peace. Those three fruit is to turn our t attention towards God. So when we begin to when we begin to to manifest those fruit, when we begin to cultivate these fruit right here, that means that we are drawing 
closer to God. We are attentive of the things of God. We are attentive of who God is, his power, his majesty, his might. We are attentive of all those things when we begin to cultivate these three, three fruit here. The second category is fruit that turns our attention towards our relationship with humanity. And those three consist of the second three, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Now, we can't be long-suffering towards God because God is long-suffering towards us. God don't need our long-suffering. So these three fruit are directed towards people. God don't need our goodness because guess what? There's no goodness in us, you know? So these three are directed towards our relationship with human beings. Now the third category is fruit which refer directly to ourself, which will be faith, meekness, which is humility, and temperance, which is self-control. So when we break down the, the, the nine spiritual fruits, we see that there are subcategories that are directed to a specific area that we need to come in contact with while we're here on this earth. And these three specific areas, when we develop these and cultivate them and begin to live by them, people will see, people will know that you are a child and I am a child of the living God. So tonight, time probably will not allow to go through all nine of those fruits. So we're going to look at the first three because the first three is the most important, I believe. Now, don't get me wrong. All of them have their e equality in who we are and what we do. But the first three is the very foundation. If we can cultivate and grow and, and, and become and, and have the attributes of the first three, the other six will follow. So tonight we're going to look at love, joy, and peace. First, look, let's look at love. Now, we've got to understand when the Bible says love, it can talk about four different types of love. Some of the, some of the words in the Bible that, of, of love in the Greek also means something else that's happening in that particular place. And sometimes at least one of these do not, do not fit into the Bible, but there's examples of that category of love that I'm going to uh, talk about. So love. So there are four types of love that the Bible speaks of or give in examples. The first type is eros. The Greek word was not used actually in the New Testament or the Old Testament, but it refers to a, a, a type of sensual love that would be found in the relationship of a husband and a wife. That's the first type. Now we all know now that type of love is only approved by God. That's only approved by God. The second type we are find is storage. And this type is the type of love signifying the natural affection between family members. And we'll see also see a, a lot of examples in the Bible about this love uh, storage. And we probably can see that um, with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Because when Lazarus died, we, we could have seen the love that they had for him by the reaction of the weeping 
and, and the sadness that they had, you know, and we really don't want to, you know, uh, talk about examples through death and all of that, but that's one, one good example because of the fact that they were a close-knit family. Uh, the third one is philio. This Greek word for love signifies spontaneous natural affection with more feeling than reason. Strong, the strong exhaustive coordinates uh, define filio as to be a friend, be a friend to, fond of an individual or object, having an affection, a matter of sentimental feeling. So this type of love really don't really don't care, have a reason, but it's just maybe you might like somebody. It's more like a brotherly love, a friendship love. You may like somebody uh, for a friend, and this is the type of love that is. So it really don't have to have a reason for that love. I mean, if I was going to be looking at stored love, the reason for that love is because that's my family member. Uh, with Eros, the reason for my love for my wife, because that's my wife. But with Filio, the, the, the reason for that love is just, I like that person. I like Brother Andrew, you know? I love Brother Andrew because that's my friend. You know, all of you I love because you, you're, you're, you're of the household of faith and you're my friend. So Filio love is more like a, a, a brotherly love. And we can kind of see that love in, in, in the relationship that Jonathan, the son of Saul, and David had. They had a great filial love relationship. We also, number four, is agape love. Now, that's, this Greek word for love is by far the one most frequently used in the New Testament. And this love means unconditional love. So this love, it doesn't matter who you are. It don't, doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter where you work, how much money you have. It don't, doesn't matter what's going on in your life. This kind of love right here is the love that Jesus had for us. As the Bible tells us, the Bible says that God gave his, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That we can be saved, right? So if he said that, were we worthy of being saved? But anyway, he showed us this agape love, not because we were worthy, it's because that he wanted us to be saved. So it's the agape love that we're going to turn our attention towards tonight. Romans 5 and 5 says, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is giving, given unto us. So we have that same love when we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We have that, we receive that agape love when God fills us with the Holy Ghost. So if we have that love, that means that there's nobody in this world that we can hate. That means that we have to treat every human equally. No matter who they are to us, no matter what they're giving us, no matter what's happening in their life, we have to treat them equally. We can't treat someone that comes in and throw a million dollars on the altar differently from somebody who only can put two dollars on the altar. We can't do it because we remember now when Jesus was standing at that giving plate and all of those Pharisees was coming in and giving all of their nice ointments and all of their riches and all of that, and they were had their chest stuck out like they were the thing going on there. And Jesus was just looking, but he wasn't really impressed by that. But there came a little lady, a little widow, 
And she had two itty bitty little coins. That's all she had to give to God. But she dropped those in that plate and it got Jesus' attention. So you see, those two little bitty coins equaled or even was more to God than even the big amounts that the Pharisees was given. So that love that Jesus have is an unconditional love. And it's the same love that comes through the Spirit of God. It's the same spiritual fruit that we're talking about right now. 1 John 3 and 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him. So God bestowed that love on us. It's the same love that he saved the world with. So if we're going to be witnesses of him. That's why the Bible says when we receive the Holy Ghost, we become witnesses of him. In Jerusalem, in Samaria, Jerusalem first, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So people are going to see that love. People should see that love. They should see the love of God through us because we are the ones that's called to produce it. And that also makes us sons or sons and daughters of God. So if we are sons and daughters of God, we should produce the same love that when Jesus was in that position, when he was in the some sonship position and he was displaying the love of God to the world, so now we receive the Holy Ghost and we're put in that position. How much more should we show the same love that he showed to the world? That's the position that we have right now as the church of the living God is to show the agape love to the world. And sometimes people do some stuff to us, boy, and it's hard. It's hard to display agape love. You know, and I mean, I, I grew up, man, I had a lady in my church, boy, she used to do all kind of things to me, but you got to remember, I only, only was two years saved then, so <laughs> thank God that I got this revelation now, so if I was to run into her today and she do something bad to me, I'll just, hey, look, I, I, you want to go to dinner? Can I buy you something to eat? Be nice to her, because if I be nice to her, it's like heaping it's like he been what? Hot coal <laughs> upon her head. So it's just bringing conviction to her. You know, so, so now we're in that position of being sons and daughters of God. We hold that position here on earth because Jesus don't hold that position anymore because he's back in heaven. John says, now, beloved, are ye the sons of God? So we're in that position now, and we have to have the same love that Jesus had when he bought, when he was here on this earth in that position. So God gives us this spiritual fruit primarily so we can have an all-encompassing, unconditional relationship with him. The spiritual fruit of love this is for our relationship with God. We can't have a relationship with man and not a godly relationship with man without having a relationship with God. So this is what Matthew says in Matthew 22, starting at verse 36. Matthew 22 and 36, it says, Master, which is the greater commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So when God give us this spiritual fruit of love, this unconditional fruit before we direct it any place else. 
it has to be directed at God. Because that is the first and the greatest commandment. Of course, he's, 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 quoting out of, um, he's quoting out of the Old Testament. So that is the first and the greatest commandment is love the Lord thy God. And you can't love God without this fruit. You, you just can't do it. That's why I see, you know, some people have a whole lot of trouble. You know, they come in and they get converted and, you know, there's just a lot of trouble trying to get them in the right direction. And I, I believe that because that they have, don't have an aspect of what the Holy Ghost brings in their life yet. And that's why they have all kind of trouble because I'm telling you, if we just, when we receive the Holy Ghost of love just fall in our heart, if that kind of love there, Guess what? We'll never leave the church. We, we wouldn't want the doors to close. So our first and foremost attention with the fruit of love is towards God. And it's the first and the greatest commandment. Love is one of the, one of the spiritual of the fruit that is a binding agent. Love binds. Bind in this text means that it glues you to. It connects you to. Now, in other texts in the Bible, it also used the word bind, and it means that it ties up. It stops, or it, it binds, or sometimes you see the word bind or bound, and it means, say, for instance, bond servant. Just means servant. But here, it's a binding agent, Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. It reads, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also ye, so also do ye. Now watch this. And above all these, so above all of that right there, higher than all of that right there, Above all these things, put on charity or love. So we can have meekness. We can have kindness. We can have humbleness. humbleness we can have long-suffering. We can even be forgiving. But the scripture says even before, before all of that right there, before you even think about doing all of that, put on charity or put on love. Because this is the thing. Love is what's going to bind all of that together and make it complete. It goes on to say, above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or completeness. So, we can have a lot of things, a lot of good things going on in our life, a lot of good works. But we still need that love to bind all of that together. So if all of that's not bind together, guess what's going to happen? That stuff is going to be hanging all over the place. You know, in an analogy, this, uh, Paul uses love of, as, a, as, a, as a binding agent to say after you've put on everything else, you take that love and you gird your waist so everything can fit tightly, everything can fit neatly, everything can fit nicely. Now, look, let me give you another example of this love, this love that binds right here. Now, we're getting dressed in the morning, you know, everybody, you know, get dressed and getting ready to go to work or the grocery store or you know, if you're a homemaker, you, you, you get ready to do, you know, your daily 
uh, chores. So, but we don't leave the house until we look in the mirror and check ourselves out. Why? Because we don't want to be going out of the house looking raggedy. You know, we, we just don't want to be looking bad going out of the house, you know. So when I get dressed in the morning, I make sure I tuck, tuck my shirt in and, you know, make everything look nice and neat. My collar, make sure that's good. My shoes is good. And, you know, my pants, they fitting right, you know. And I'm looking in the mirror and I say, oh, you know something? I, I need something here. Run back to my closet and get my belt. And then I put my belt on, you see, because if I don't put my belt on, by the time I get in my truck and get out where I'm going at, guess what? My shirt going to be all over here and all over there and all over, hanging all over the place. So, you see, I use that, 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 that belt to bind stuff together, to bind that shirt and that pants together so it'll fit perfectly. It'll fit tightly. It'll fit neatly. And I know some of you all, some of you ladies can understand that because, I mean, you look in the mirror and say, this thing just needs something to bring it together, you know? And you might go get a, a belt or a scarf or something that just bring the thing together to make it look good. So this is how love is. When we have all of that right there and we take that love and we wrap it around all of this meekness and this gentleness and this kindness and we wrap it around that, guess what? It's fitting just right and God looking down on it and saying, that's what I'm talking about right there. That's the kind of love that we need to have right there. So love is above all of that, you know. And then the Bible goes on to tell us, of, and I think we know this scripture a little bit, you know, that we can have all of that stuff, all of that good stuff, and if we don't have love, that we just like sounding brass and a symbol that's just making a lot of noise. So we can have everything that God wants us to be we can be everything that God has called us to be but if we don't have love to bind all of that together we just make a noise and I think God don't like that kind of noise he like joyful noise he don't like noise that just say I'm this but you're not doing or you're not really have what he say have so it also binds us to Christ because if Christ is love and then we have the love of Christ guess what that mean that we sticking right there with him that mean that we're like one with him that mean that we have the same mind that mean that we have the same heart so it binds us to Christ it binds us to the church it binds us to the to the saints of God and that's where we need to be that's what's going to keep us Colossians 2, 9 through 11, 9 through 10, excuse me, says, For in him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality. So if love binds us to perfectness, perfectness or completeness, that means we are complete in who? In Christ. So we've got to be bound to Christ. And love is what binds us to Christ. Secondly, let's take a look at joy. Someone once said, can you praise God in your worst circumstances or in your worst conditions or when the condition or the circumstance seems like it's going to never change well we know that some people can't praise God in their circumstances or in their situation or they don't have the endurance to wait until that storm passed because if a whole lot of people did guess what this sanctuary will be packed out tonight So, when we look at joy, 
joy is one of the fruits that take us through all of the things that we're going to face in this life. So when we look at joy, it gives us the fruit. Joy is to strengthen us in trials and tribulation that will accompany our journey from earth to heaven. And we got to believe that we're going to have some times that we just don't know what to do. You know, we're going to have some times that the devil comes in and try to steal your joy. We're going to have some times where it feels like God ain't nowhere around, man. We're going to have some times that we just lost. We just don't know what to do. But we know that we're in the house of God. But, I mean, I'm paying my tithes. I'm giving in to the building fund. I'm giving in to the completion offering. I'm giving in to the acoustics program. I'm giving everything that I have. But I'm still going through these tests, these trials, these tribulations, and I just don't understand why. Those are the times that we need something that it, it don't even have to be an assurance that we're going to make it through the, 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 the trial of the tribulation. But we just need something that will tell us that, well, just be glad you're in the trial and the tribulation. Don't, don't matter what the outcome is, just be glad you're in there. Because if you're in there, that means that God is dealing with you. That means that God is somewhere around. You might can't see him because of the rain, or you can't see him because of the darkness, or you can't see him because of the clouds, but God is still somewhere around. And we need something that's going to take us through those kind of times. And I think God gave us joy so we can overcome those trials and those tribulations. First Peter 4 and 1 says, For as much then as Christ has suffered, for us in the flesh, arm or get ready yourself likewise with the same mind. So there's no doubt, there's no doubt that even as we love Christ, even as we follow Christ, even as we do everything according to what the word of God says, we still going to have some times where trouble is going to come. That's just kind of a part of life. Then the Bible tells us that God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. So sometime when we're living for God and sometime even more when we're living for God that we're going to have a lot of life situations that, that's hard and we can't understand. But James 1 and 2 says this. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or different trials. So we're not, God gave us this spiritual fuel of joy, so we won't be moping around all the time. That we won't be looking like we're eating lemon heads all the time. That we won't be looking like we're just cast out all the time. So even through the trials and even through the tribulation, God gave us this joy so we can still shout, so we can still dance, so we can still run the aisles. That's what this joy here is for. And this joy, the world didn't give it to us. And guess what? We're not going to let the world take it away. Because even when it seems like we're down, guess what? We're still going to give God the glory. That's what this joy that we're talking about tonight. So James tell us, count it joy when we have tribulation. Count it joy. But I want to make clear that the joy from the Lord is not the same as happiness. Because in the midst of a storm, there's no happiness right there. Happiness is an external factor that touches us and it alters our mood to be up here. 
That's what happiness is because of the fact that when we get a new car and that thing's smelling brand new and we just kind of like leaning and we cruise and we drive up in front of the church and want to park there all service. We feel good, right? I mean, that, that, that's good when you get that new suit from wherever you buy your suits from or your new dress and you come in church and you feeling good, you happy because you, you looking good, you smelling good, you know, everything's going good, you happy. But I tell you what, you let that suit snag on one of those chairs and you look down and threads hanging all out of there. You, you think that you're still going to be happy? Or you let some crazy person driving down the street and run a red light and smash into your car. And you're looking at that car like, now, this is not the car that I bought from that dealership. You think that's going to make you happy? Because happiness is predicated on external things. And we know that if it's made by man, or of, if it's of this world, that means that happiness is only going to be short-lived. That's not the kind of thing that we need to make it through a storm. Because sometimes a spiritual storm goes for a while. But we need the joy of the Lord. So happiness and joy is not the same thing. Joy is an internal fruit from the Holy Ghost that is able to strengthen us and carry us through. So if I got joy and I rip that suit and I look at it and I say, oh my Lord, God is still good. You know, somebody ran into that car, I get out of it and look at it, Lord, look at the brand new car that I just got. But God, I thank you that I wasn't injured. Sometimes we can't see our bills be paid. We can't see things, but we still have that joy. We still say, thank you, Lord. We still say, we love you, Lord. We appreciate you, Lord, because that comes from an eternal source of the Holy Ghost. That don't come from an external source because if we depend on this external stuff, guess what? All of this stuff going to burn up. Then what we going to say? Nehemiah 8 and 10, it says, Then he said unto them, Go your way and eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, nor for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of of the Lord, that spiritual fruit of joy is what strengthens us in the time that we need. You know, the Bible says in, in, in Psalm that we're going to look to the hills from which cometh our help, all of our help coming from the Lord. When we look to the hills, we see God in his, in his natural, his godly state. When we look to the hills, we can see Christ Jesus hanging on the cross. When we look to the hills, we can see the mercies of God. When we look to the hills, we can see his majesty, his glory, his power, his everything that he is. That's why we should look to the hills. And when we see that right there, no matter what's going on in this world and no matter what's going on in our life, we're going to start dancing because we know that we're on the victorious side. We know we're on the side of God. So that's why the Bible, David said, I'm going to look to the hills from which cometh my help. Not because he's just looking and then God is just going to send a lightning bolt down there and kill all the enemies around him. Not, not because of that. It's because God is going to send some more joy, send more joy, and send more joy and strengthen you. So he's given us the ability to get through the storm. He don't always have to end the storm because he wants us to go through it. So he gives us the ability to end, to go through the storm. 
So even in the worst time of our sanctified life, the joy that the Lord has given us is designed to give us the strength to endure, to overcome, so that we can see the end of our faith. This joy, spiritual joy, is going to enable us to see God. Because without making it through those trials and tribulations, without that strength, we won't see God. Because eventually, the devil is going to knock us off of where we're supposed to be. So we need this joy. First Peter 1, 7 through 9 says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than silver, than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom have not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, ye believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So you see, even though we're going through those fiery trials, that spiritual fruit of joy sometimes get seem like God just keep piling it in and piling it in. He knows what you're going through. He knows the situation. Sometimes we can't realize that, but he knows the situation and he keeps sending joy and sending joy and sending joy and you just keep praising him and saying thank you Jesus and sometimes you be, the, your words are unspeakable. The understanding is unspeakable. You can't even say anything but you're still in the midst of your storm and you are still praising God with words that's unspeakable. You can't realize the type of joy that God has given in those storms. So it's unspeakable. And then not only that, it's full of glory. It's full of his glory. So his glory is in that joy. And his glory is taking you through. Just because of his glory and his unspeakable joy, we are able to stand every day in this world. Psalms 3, 30 and 5. It says, for his anger endure but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping, we familiar with this one, right? Weeping may endure for the storm or for the night or for the trial or for the tribulation. Weeping may endure, but that don't mean that you ain't got, you don't have joy. Just because I'm crying in my bed saying, Lord, I know you're going to come and save me. I may not see it now, but I, I believe you, Lord. That don't mean you got joy because you jump up the next morning and guess what? You're going on your way. Whatever you got to do to, and the, whatever you got to do the next day, you still going to do it. Because if you didn't have that joy, you'll be like most people in the world when things happen, they get depressed. They stay in bed all day. They don't want to see anybody. They don't answer the phone. They don't want you to see them. Some of them even, God forbid, commit suicide. But we got the joy of the Lord and it's able to take us through that night. So when we get done with that night, guess what? We're going to see that joy. We're going to realize that joy. Even though we're still praising him in the midst of the storm, but how much harder are we going to praise him when we come out of that storm? That joy is our strength. So that, 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 that spiritual fruit of joy, we need that. I I'm going to tell you, I need it every day. Every day I need it. So let's look at our third one, peace. The Greek word for peace is irony, which means to join, quietness, rest, to be set in place. This peace is not the same peace that you would hear in the daily news when they talk about Afghanistan and Russia, 
the Middle East, Ukraine, Iran, when everybody just want everybody to kind of live in harmony. It, that's not the same peace because, I mean, the Bible tells us that those things are going to get worse. So they're looking and they're searching and they're trying to find something that will bring some silence to their lives. But as they look and they search, it seems like things is getting worse and worse. And we can see it. So that's not the kind of peace that we're talking about here. But, we talk, but, but the peace that we're talking about tonight is the peace that ends our war against God. That's the kind of peace that we're talking about. We're not talking about peace in this world because this world is never going to have peace. The Bible says when they think it's peace, guess what? It's sudden destruction. So that's not the kind of peace we're looking for. Romans 8, 6, and 7. It says, for to be carnally mind is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's the spiritual fruit right there. Because the carnal mind is enmity or at war against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So you see, the type of peace that they're looking for, that's cardinal peace. That's peace that they're trying to, to create themselves. That's not the kind of peace that the, spirit, the, the fruit of the Spirit is talking about. But Romans 5 and 1 tells us, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Christ Jesus. So we have peace because we're justified. We believe God. We heard the word tell us to be to repent. We heard it tell us to be baptized in Jesus name. We heard it say that God will infill us with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongue and we by faith move towards that. And when we move towards that and we were and 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 we were we were brought out of this world when we were saved God justified us so he made us right in his eyes before then we were at war with God and we know how the what the outcome of that was going to be so he justified us through Lord Jesus Christ and so now we have peace now we should be able to understand this peace but this is the thing the world can't understand this. They can't understand this when they persecute you and you still feed them. When they talk about you and you still love them. When they do all types of lying on you and you still come to them and ask them how they're doing. They can't understand this type of peace right here because this peace comes from God. Philippians 4 and 7 says, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding. So this peace that we have passes anything that they can understand out there. It passes, I don't care how many degrees that they got from MIT, from Sanford, Stanford, from any of those universities. They can't understand this peace because it only comes through the Holy Ghost, and it passes all natural understanding. So not only that does it pass all natural understanding, but it shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So when all kind of stuff going on in the world, and the devil is trying to put fear in us, telling us that, well, uh, the terrorist is going to bomb your neighborhood, well, you know what? Guess what? If they bomb it, what can I do? I can't do anything, but I know one thing. But I got my mind guarded. I got my heart guarded. So I'm not going to let that type of, type of fear or type of stuff from the world come inside because I'm going to have the peace of God. And it's going to protect me from all of that. Peace also is a spiritual bonding agent. Also, uh, like love. Ephesians 4 and 3, it says, Endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So this 
peace is a bonding agent that keeps us connected to the unity of the faith, which is the body of Christ. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. He is not the author of confusion. So if God is not the author of confusion and I'm causing confusion, guess what? I'm not bonded to you. I'm not bonded to you. I'm not bonded to you. I'm not stuck to the body of Christ. In order to make it to heaven, we have to be bonded to the body of Christ. This is not just not a one-man game right here. This is not a one-man event right here. But this is an event that all of us are involved in, and this is an event that all of us have to help each other make it to heaven. So we have to be bonded. We have to be stuck on. We have to be actually tied to each other. And that's what peace do. So if I have peace with you and you have peace with me, guess what? We're going to be living in God's harmony. And that's how that is. So peace is a bonding agency. Also, without peace, we can't make it to heaven. Can't, can't, just can't, can't do it. Can't make it to heaven without peace. Hebrews 12 and 14, it says... Follow, that means go after. Go after peace over here, I'm going after it. Peace going this way, I'm going after it. Follow peace with all men. That means that we have to be peaceful with all men. And holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. No man shall see the Lord. So, if we are a person who raised a lot of sand, when the rapture come, bye-bye. If we are a person who caused a lot of confusion, when God split those, those clouds, guess what? Bye-bye. I feel for you. Because without the peace of God, and this is, unconditional peace also it don't matter who because the bible says if your enemy harm you we should do what we should feed him we should clothe him we should do the same thing that god done to his enemies so with if if if, if these if, if they hung jesus on the cross and they said father forgive them that's making peace right there with those folks he's peaceful say it again Bye-bye. So we need to have peace. We need to have peace to see the Lord. And in closing, and the singers can come. Fruit, which turns our thought towards God, turns our uh, thoughts towards relationship with God. It's love, Everybody say it after me. Love, joy, and peace. We need those three fruit, and I can tell you that if we can cultivate and grow and produce those three fruit, all the rest of them, the fruit towards men, humanity, and the fruit that's towards ourselves, that concerns ourselves, will grow. So let's... Let's show the love of Christ. Let's show agape love. Let's show agape love. Let's, let's have peace with everybody. Let's have peace with everybody. And then when they try to attack you because you're trying to have peace, just give them a little bit of joy. That's all you got to do. And God will continue to keep us. God will continue to bless us. And God will continue to help us until that great and glorious day of the Lord.